How do we pass history on from generation to generation, and what do we do when that meaning is lost? We're talking nursery rhymes this week on Footnoting History. Childhood is all about rhyme. From nursery rhymes to skipping songs and jumping rope, our childhood is rife with various rhythmical verses. For parents, it's all about teaching the music of the language and the rhythms that you can um, use to speak and to sing. But meaning has sort of fallen by the wayside. And unfortunately, a lot of rhymes that we sing today, we don't necessarily think about what they mean and where they come from and often they have very specific origins. Other times, we look back at a rhyme and create a way that it fits in with a historical event, perhaps creating a history for a rhyme that wasn't there in the first place. And sometimes it's hard to tell which one's which. Uh, a lot of rhymes suddenly found histories in the 19th century. This is actually terribly common for oral histories. You'll see the same thing in early Islamic history that Histories in later centuries are actually far more detailed than earlier ones. But that doesn't make these stories any less fun. We can't necessarily guarantee that the stories that we tell are accurate, but they make a lot of sense and they add a depth to the rhymes that we grow up with from day one. So keeping in mind that today we're talking more about cultural memory and how we recreate that, let's talk about some specific rhymes. Let's start with Little Jack Horner. Now, in case you don't know it, here it is. It's Little Jack Horner sat in the corner eating a Christmas pie. He put in his thumb and pulled out a plum and said, What a good boy am I! Now, Little Jack Horner probably didn't exist. Most of the stories agree that Jack was actually Thomas. And Thomas Horner was um, a messenger for Glastonbury Abbey. And following the dissolution of the monasteries in 1536, uh, when Henry VIII decided that the money stored in um, a lot of these monasteries was probably better in the royal fisc, Richard Whiting, the abbot of Glastonbury Abbey, decided to try to bribe the king. And to do so, he sent Thomas with a pie to the king. Now, inside the pie, there were 12 deeds to various manor houses throughout England. And so Thomas opened up the pie and snuck out the deed to Mel's Manor in Somerset. Now, basically, Mel's Manor is in the Mendip Hills, and so the plum that little Jack Horner pulled out, in some interpretations, applies to uh, the lead mines in the area that were associated with the manor. It could also mean uh, the plum bob used on a lot of surveying equipment. He passed the rest of the pie and the other 11 deeds to Henry VIII, who, of course, was not impressed. So Thomas Cromwell ended up questioning the abbot personally, and he was tried in November of 1539. Interestingly, one of the jurors of Richard Whiting's trial was none other than Thomas Horner. The entire affair only lasted a few hours before Whiting was found guilty along with two of his monks. They were hanged, drawn, and quartered. Now that's interesting because it means that they were tried as traitors, not heretics. Of course, this account is somewhat disputed. The Horners still live in Mel's Manor, and they maintain that the estate was purchased in an honest transaction from Henry in 1543, and that the original deed with the king's seal is still in their possession. This goes to show that the history recreated through nursery rhymes is often very subjective. Now, it's possible they did purchase it from Henry VIII in 1543, and it's possible that they did receive that deed. It doesn't necessarily mean that they weren't in collusion with the king against the abbey, and it doesn't mean that they didn't already have possession of that land. It's hard to say. I think it is safe to say, though, that whether the land was stolen, bought, or gifted, as another account says, it was still quite the plum acquisition. 
Now, speaking of plums, let's move on to an entirely different rhyme. This one is The Lion and the Unicorn. Now, I grew up with this one, but I'm half British. Um, so for the American audience, in case you're not familiar with it, it's The Lion and the Unicorn were fighting for the crown. The lion beat the unicorn all around the town. Some gave them white bread and some gave them brown. Some gave them plum cake and drummed them out of town. So the lion and the unicorn are the heraldic animals of England and Scotland, respectively. And to say that they're fighting for the crown or they're spoiling for a fight, as another version goes, it's pretty apparent that that's almost always been the case. The fate of the two countries got really entangled and messed up when James VI of Scotland became James I of England on the death of Elizabeth I. She had no children, so it went to her cousin's son. Now, the Stuart line actually failed after Anne in 1714. She didn't have any children that survived infancy despite 17 pregnancies. In 1701, Parliament passed the Act of Settlement, which confirmed the Electress Sophia of Hanover, who was a granddaughter of James I, as Anne's heir to the English and Irish thrones. And the reason they did this is to prevent a Catholic from inheriting, and the rest of the House of Stuart was Catholic. This was basically forced onto Scotland in the Acts of Union on the 1st of May 1707, which unified Scotland, England, and Ireland into the United Kingdom. When Anne died in 1714, Scotland was not necessarily married to this whole idea of being part of the United Kingdom. And James the Pretender, the son of the deposed James II, was not necessarily prepared to give up his claim. In 1715, then, he began the Jacobite Rebellion, which went precisely nowhere, and then his son, Bonnie Prince Charlie, tried again in 1745. Now, Charlie had more success, but not by much. He was still defeated at Culloden in April of 1746, at which point he fled to the Isle of Skye. Amusingly, the Isle of Skye is about 500 meters from the mainland, and it's now linked by a bridge. As he fled across Scotland, various Scots uh, supported him in what ways they could, but it was all very under the table because support for Bonnie Prince Charlie was a very dicey thing politically, and it could mean disastrous things for your own health and safety. In an apocryphal tale, I have a great uncle who uh, stored up a lot of the clan histories and knowledge over the course of his lifetime. And he very adamantly told me that uh, my own clan, Lamont, had bankrupted itself in order to purchase the ship that sent Charlie to Skye. Now, Charlie went to Skye on a French frigate, so I'm not sure how much truth is there, but it does show you how much Scottish identity is tied up with this particular story. So, people supported Bonnie Prince Charlie to the extent that they could, so some gave them white bread and some gave them brown, but no one dared support him sufficiently to continue his rebellion. They drummed him out of town. This is a very pretty story, is it not? But much like my great uncle's story about Bonnie Prince Charlie's ship, there's some issues with it. For example, the first version of this verse, which didn't include the some gave them white bread, some gave them brown, was published in 1709, almost 40 years before that rebellion. Now, the Scots are fond of singing about the Stuarts, and the Stuarts even in England had um, a lot of issues that were recorded in rhyme. We'll step back a couple of years, and we're going to talk about maybe one of the most famous nursery rhymes, Humpty Dumpty. Of course, everyone knows it. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Now, that part that everyone knows is actually the third verse, and it's what's commonly repeated today. The first and second verses, though, clearly tell the rest of the story. So here it goes. In 1648, when England suffered the pains of state, the Roundheads laid siege to Colchester Town, where the king's men still fought for the crown. There one-eyed Thompson stood on the wall, a gunner of deadliest aim of all. From St. Mary's Tower, his cannon he fired. Humpty Dumpty was its name. Clearly, then, this is a propaganda piece mocking Charles I from the English Civil War. 
it's a bit of a long stretch to go from being a giant gun to an egg. So how did that happen? We think today of Humpty Dumpty being an egg because, you know, he's broken into many pieces. He can't put it back together again. But that really only came about in 1871 with Sir John Tenniel's illustrations for Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass. This is very obviously a case where the meaning of the rhyme has been changed to fit the needs of changing times. Humpty Dumpty is fairly straightforward as to what it really means, and many other rhymes are just not nearly as clear-cut. So take, for example, Mary Mary Quite Contrary. Mary Mary Quite Contrary, how does your garden grow? With silver bells and cockle shells and pretty maids all in a row. Who is Mary? It depends on who you ask. It could be the Virgin Mary, Mary Queen of Scots, or even Queen Mary I. So silver bells and cockle shells are obviously Catholic symbology. Bells call parishioners to mass. Cockle shells are the sign of the pilgrimage to Santiago de Compostela for St. James. Of course, if you like your Mary's virginal, then the pretty maids in a row are nuns sworn to serve the Catholic faith. In that interpretation, there's two unclear points. Um, is the rhyme supposed to mock or to celebrate Mary? And why is Mary contrary? I don't think I've ever heard the Virgin Mary described as being contrary in any way. Unless you get into some of the stories from the Cantigas de Santa Maria. If you prefer a Scottish tone, then Mary Queen of Scots is certainly a viable choice. Like her cousin, Mary I, that we'll talk about in a minute, she was confined for most of her life under constant surveillance due to her Catholic faith and the, the threat it posed to Protestant rule in England. She was the queen of Scotland and France, but she was caught scheming against Elizabeth and she was put to death on the 8th of February, 1587. This is definitely a case where patience could have served her so very well. In that interpretation, of course, in the garden is the fact that she's confined. She doesn't have a lot of room to go around, so all she gets to do is grow her garden and stay true to her Catholic faith. On a more sinister note, if Mary I is your choice of Mary, then the garden could mean a graveyard, where she sent many pretty maids for their Protestant beliefs. In a more far-fetched version, the cockle shells, silver bells, and pretty maids are all torture instruments, but... The use of torture in any of the religious upsets in England is a topic for another podcast and a chunk of my graduate career. Uh, it just didn't happen that often, so I'm less inclined to believe that. And furthermore, there are so many variations on the words to this particular rhyme that finding any definite tie to anything is um, a little tricky. For instance, the last line could be, and so my garden grows, or cowslips all in a row, or and marigolds all in a row, or with lady bells all in a row. So finding one interpretation that would apply to all of these various lines is probably not going to happen. And then take on top of that that there's actually an entirely different version that's Mistress Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow? With silver bells and cockle shells, sing cuckolds all in a row. Now that one sounds far more interesting. That does illustrate some of the issues with working with oral culture, though, the different versions of this rhyme. This might actually indicate that it's an older rhyme. Some of the later ones actually start out written down, and so there's a lot less variation. Say Humpty Dumpty. We all have one version of Humpty Dumpty. So that might mean that Mary Mary, quite contrary, is fairly old. On the other hand, there's no definitive proof that it existed before the 19th century. It's quite a conundrum. Interpreting nursery rhymes, then, is an art that reflects more about the interpreter's time and the interpreter's culture than it does the actual rhyme in a lot of cases, then. So you see things like Ring Around the Rosie, which has been interpreted as a plague rhyme for the longest time, but it's recently come under scrutiny. That's what makes nursery rhymes such an interesting version of history. Add on top of that that most of them were probably meant to be propaganda to begin with and get a very skewed view of the world through a child's eyes. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find links to further reading suggestions related to this week's episode, as well as a calendar of upcoming podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Until next time, remember... The best stories are always in the footnotes. See you next week.